Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, and thank you for watching today's Ag Forecast brought to you by Nutrient Ag Solutions. We're going to begin first with a satellite animation from yesterday, where we saw numerous reports of severe winds from the storms that moved through parts of the Northeast. And then in the Central Plains, where we had a moderate risk for severe storms, you can see the deep convection there, multiple storms stretching from Texas clear back into parts uh, of Wyoming uh, and through the middle, and Kansas uh, in, in parts of Nebraska, some of these storms were quite large. In fact, I want to take a quick moment here and just zoom in and show you what those storms looked like yesterday. We watched this storm blow up right here in Kansas near Hayes. And uh, just as I rock back and forth, look at the depth of that storm and the size of its anvil. Uh, that tells me that this storm tapped into a lot of cape, plenty of moisture, and it was a hailer, produced a lot of hail and also had rotation to it reporting, uh, producing a tornado. Later on in the day, as the storms continued to fire a bit farther to the north, I noticed a couple of very just amazing things. I love looking at this. You see the uh, boundary layer gravity waves in through this area and just the repeated complexes of storms that fired on this shortwave that was moving through this area. And just to, as the sun sets here, you know, the convection just filled in, and those anvils uh, from those storms basically covered the state of Nebraska. Very impressive to see that. When we put it all together, this was the storm reports from yesterday. And you can see that in the northeast, numerous reports of severe winds. But in the central plains, it was a lot of hail uh, and tornadic activity, 28 reports. So far, the unfiltered reports hit 544. And just a great resource I, I hope that you all check out. Storm Prediction Center, they actually keep track of this. And they keep a constant count of severe weather and, and make these great graphics to show us where it's been. So this is what we've had so far through 2021. Now, this does not include... Uh, the severe wind reports from yesterday. Uh, but as you look at this, uh, we can kind of filter things down. Our tornado reports here, a lot of it concentrated down here in the south into the southeast, but the, the central plains certainly have had their fair share as well. Wind damage, again, a very similar story. Much of this severe weather threat this year has been either in the south central plains or in the high plains, then back here into the southeast, uh, um, excuse me, the, the lower Mississippi River Valley over toward the southeast. And same thing with our hail threat uh, so far this year. So, you know, if you think about from Pennsylvania through Illinois and back through Iowa and to the upper Midwest, this is an area that we have yet to have seen significant severe weather return to the, to the region. And I think it's just important to, to kind of keep note of that. By the way, great stuff you can do with this. You actually get a great, um, almost like a histogram of, or, or at least a count here of severe weather events. And then they break it down by state, by month, and even the most active days. I think that once they filter out the, the multiple reports, that yesterday's storm reports could be the second most active day on severe weather behind the severe wind reports that were on May the 4th that hit the southeast. Uh, from here, let's go take a look at some of the hail data. Uh, notice these are the colors uh, for two to three inch hail. And if I zoom in here on those storms in Kansas, we see a lot of that size hail. And I was out on Twitter uh, just watching for some of the reports to come in. And Tornado Alley, that's her Twitter handle here, uh, shows us some of the larger hail that was in Hayes, Kansas. And I imagine there was a lot of damage done by hail that large. Well, in the overnight hours, the storms did progress a bit farther to the east, and so we can see some of the active lightning reports from early this morning. Again, this comes from blitzertongue.org. Storms were moving through parts of Missouri past Kansas City, but still more behind it here in Kansas and southern Nebraska. In Iowa, the storms have been rolling through as well, and I think that's absolutely critical because if we just take a look at where the precipitation is this morning, you can see that those storms finally have moved into an area that has missed out on some of the rain lately. I'm talking about eastern North Dakota and South Dakota. I'm talking about western Iowa and southern uh, Minnesota. You see that area, when you look back over the last week, had just streaky storms through it. This is the last seven days of total accumulated precipitation. So to see moisture return to that area uh, is very good. Big questions we're going to go after in this video. Do we ever return moisture down here to the southeast, in the, at least in the near term? Because that large blocking ridge has prevented uh, much thunderstorm activity and the return of any good moisture. It's all been going around the periphery, hammering the south uh, right here through Texas, Oklahoma, you know, Arkansas and Louisiana. 
What happens in the northeast and eastern Corn Belt? Do we move rain through parts of uh, the Tennessee Valley to the Ohio Valley and then eventually into the Mid-Atlantic? Those would be regions that are absolutely desperate for it. You know, we've looked a lot at these maps throughout uh, the spring, and this is just to kind of give you up-to-date information here on the way that May has shaped up so far. So this is May 1st through the 27th precipitation ranks by Climate District. So as we examine the map, those areas that I just stressed, you know, getting moisture to the Mid-Atlantic, uh, into the Eastern Corn Belt. It rained already once this week in Lower Michigan. We got more on the way. The rain that just came through here early this morning is fantastic. Will it slow down in the Southern United States? I'm sorry, but I don't think it will. We're gonna to continue to see open Gulf transport and I'll show those precip totals in a few moments. Meanwhile, out West where we've had near record dryness uh, from California all the way through the Great Basin uh, into, I mean, look at the Climate Reporting District in Spokane, driest May on record coming through right now. We have some serious heat pushing into this area, triple digits. We got to get to talking about that because that will certainly stress crops. Speaking of stressed crops, I would like to show you one other graphic here before we move into this forecast. And what it is showing you is cumulative downward solar flux. In other words, how much of the sun's light gets down to the to the surface. So we notice how very cloudy parts of the Mid-South and the Southern Plains getting over to the lower Mississippi River Valley has been throughout this month of, uh, well, the end of April through the beginning of May. Uh, I, I wonder if folks down here feel as though they haven't seen the sun much because it has been very cloudy in that area. Uh, I kind of add this up. Uh, it would be as though the sun didn't come out for about four days. That's, that's the total missing solar radiation. It's as though over the last month, you didn't get any sun for four straight 24-hour time periods. So enough with those statistics. Let's see where this is going. Because if we look at that soil moisture data, it's been very wet in this area. We're going to return moisture to the Mid-Atlantic, unfortunately coming in, in the form of severe storms. Moisture will be coming through parts of the Eastern Corn Belt. And we saw this morning where it was coming through in this area because these top 40 centimeters or 16 inches of soil moisture are looking pretty rough in through several areas here across the east. I was giving a talk yesterday in Colorado, talking to some corn growers, and uh, some got some reports here of delays in planting due to a lot of very wet conditions, uh, which has been a long time since we've been able to say that about the high plains that are through Colorado. Okay, forecast time. We look right now at the low-level wind field, and there is a deep low that is taking shape right here this morning moving through Iowa. It's certainly got a lot of moisture out ahead of it. The main frontal boundary is still behind it. We're going to watch storms pop up off that boundary, move away from it, giving us multiple chances of storms as the boundary eventually comes through. But this low is headed east. And we will see how storms return to the east. But I have a larger question if to not we can break down, as to whether or not we can break down this ridge over the southeast permanently. So today's severe weather threat from Texas into Illinois, right in through this area. We're going to watch again for multiple rounds of storms popping off of the main boundary. As we stretch into tomorrow, the frontal boundary sacks farther to the south. What we end up getting is the first system moving its way over toward basically Washington, D.C. So we do have a slight risk for tomorrow, but the frontal boundary stretches through here. And we already see the return of moisture coming through this area as early as Friday. And it's going to continue throughout the weekend. So high resolution NAM, park it right here at 6 a.m. We noticed that the models did a fairly good job at seeing the storms moving through this area. Although uh, they, they kind of left out in the overnight hours, they missed what was happening in this part of Kansas. So the models are struggling with this convective regime. What we see is that throughout the day on uh, Thursday. Can you almost see two separate boundaries of storms, maybe even a third? The first round of storms likely pops off the boundary and moves through stretching maybe from Chicago to St. Louis and then back down here toward, you know, this part of Arkansas. But there's a second round that follows it by, uh, by this evening and the whole low pressure system moves in the overnight hours through lower Michigan and I couldn't be happier to see rainfall in this area in the overnight hours through this morning. But you'll notice that the models are struggling with the convective type and timing along that stalled out boundary. But there is good evidence that we're going to get some storms that not only move through the mid-Atlantic, you can see them there in the day uh, on Friday, but also here through parts of Tennessee, Kentucky, other area that's been quite dry. As we get into the tail end of this system, notice how the 
high res NAM is not bringing in good storm activity into parts of um, the Carolinas. I'll have to watch that carefully to see if that changes uh, because that's an area that desperately needs the rainfall. But by the time we get out to Saturday morning, we're already returning that moisture from the south. Now the pattern moving forward is an important one to diagnose. So let's look at 500 millibar heights for troughs and ridges and go out here through the next eight or nine days. First trough we're watching is this one. So that's by Sunday. Behind it, high pressure builds in. It's got cooler air in it. So we're going into a cool Labor Day, excuse me, Memorial Day weekend uh, here in, in the eastern part of the country. After that passes through, watch the west. A very large ridge begins to build here, bringing in triple digit heat. And with that, major risk of high evaporation rates and a lot of stress uh, on the crops there. But stretching in through here, the models, while they flank the United States with ridges, have a broader trough in this area. And at the low levels, we're just going to keep returning moisture, keeping that region quite stormy. So I'd like to show it to you by going to the operational European model. Wave number one, now again, this was in the overnight hours. This is by midday today. That wave moves through. We've talked about the severe storm threat here. We're now into Friday morning, Friday afternoon, and evening. So that's going to be the boundary. Let me step you back one time step there, right there. We're going to watch for our strong to severe storms on Friday afternoon and evening. Now that moves toward the east. And as you saw, the European model also breaks up the rainfall and does not return it to the Carolinas, but better moisture to the north in the very dry places in Virginia, West Virginia, Pennsylvania, New York. These are areas that need this rainfall. Now after that, a large high pressure cell builds in and the flow around it returns the moisture to the high plains for the remainder of the weekend. So we're going to go stormy here cooler east but dry in this area throughout the um, Memorial Day weekend. And then as we work our way out into the day on Monday, let's pause this on Monday here, uh, mid-afternoon, open transport of moisture and complexes of thunderstorms rolling through this area. Drier east and very dry and extremely hot to the west. So as I just take you out to next week, this is through Tuesday, getting into Wednesday, we continue to keep a corridor open in terms of transport of moisture and thunderstorm activity. Whereas the Southeast just can't seem to buy a pattern change to bring in meaningful rainfall. And so just going all the way out here to next Thursday, that's the corridor that stays open. And I'm worried about the continuation of drought risk in this area developing here. Because if I stitch it all together, system number one, that's through Sunday morning. Okay, so we've seen that one. Now, after the flow pattern, builds into that high, and then returns the moisture. Look, as I go through Sunday into Monday, you start to see the storms coming back up on the high plains there. As I then go out through Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, let's go all the way out to next week, the latest European model brings in a lot of precipitation, almost in ring of fire type setup, but very dry in parts of North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, possibly stretching back to Mississippi which means that dry area is expected to continue to stay that way. If we go out there and look at week two, we've already seen the pattern, heat and, and, and dryness to the west, but the models continue to favor stormy conditions from Texas through the northeast. But I look at this and I, I'm suspicious of what could happen in this area. The European brings in the flow to increase the chances of storms. So I, for the southeast to the mid-Atlantic, I'm rooting the European model on here. But the GFS, notice how it keeps the coast drier. I think that's an important difference to be seeing here, given what we're talking about through our cotton belt. All right, from there, model performance. I told you last time we were doing well, and it's since dropped off a lot. And some of the recent skill scores from the GFS have been extremely low, but the European has dropped off as well. I want to thank Dr. Maui for sharing this graphic with me so I can share it with you. So with that, why don't we get into a discussion on temperature? This just tells you that I don't trust those week two forecasts very much at all right now. We know that throughout much of May, it was cool. Although lately over our last seven days, we've had a lot of heat building here uh, in, in this section of North America and really into the Southeast as of late. But there's been some cooler air that's been building here in the Canadian Prairie. And unfortunately, as that colder air comes in with that high, we now see frost advisories, frost uh, warnings and freeze warnings that are here along our Northern border with Canada, stretching into the Great Lakes and also into the Northeast. So we got some cold air that's coming in here. 
we look at those temperatures this morning, these white contours, see it there? That one marks where we've got um, below 32. And it appears that Friday morning could be the morning where there's quite a bit of patchy frost here in the upper Midwest and northern plains. Now that cooler air, Saturday through Wisconsin, see it? Going then into Sunday and Monday. Got some overnight lows here. Look at Sunday morning all the way down through Illinois. Lows in the low 40s. Open those windows and enjoy that. That's some dry, cool air there. And then that cooler air pushes to the east while we, I mean, just a blowtorch of a start to June happens in the west. Let me show it to you. Here's high temperatures today. There's Friday, Saturday. This is our Memorial Day weekend. Look at these temperatures on Saturday. And then as you go from there into Sunday and Monday, triple digits in the Central Valley, 90s in the Columbia Basin, and that's the beginning of it. As we go into Tuesday, now we're in the mid-90s into this area, 108 in Sacramento, all the way to 103 in Phoenix, very, very hot in the west. And while we have a lot of thunderstorm activity here, on the return of moisture and more cloud cover, we're still keeping it cool in Texas. Very interesting pattern developing here. Beyond that, day 5 through 10, we see extreme heat in the west. We're almost off the top of my color bar here, better than 20 degrees above average. So that heat for the start of June is firmly established uh, in the western part of the United States. And the cooler weather here will be fading with time. Going out there longer term, though, and we're going to wrap it up here, with the pattern favoring those large ridges on each side of the United States, it appears that we're going to help to shove the jet stream farther to the north very quickly. So the cooler patterns that we had been seeing, well, if you look at it, the time period of June 9th through July the 9th, most of the United States is favoring well above average temperatures. I'm not going to show you the precipitation map because I don't have an ounce of trust in it. But I will say this, excuse me, when we look out here and watch where the MJO is going, it's coming out of the Western Pacific over in phase sixes and seven and heading possibly on a reset back over toward Africa. What it's not doing is it's not swinging through the Indian Ocean or going over toward, well, Australia. That's what maritime continent means. And why I think this is important is that if we look in the Indian Ocean right now, the warmer water here and the cooler water there represents something called the negative phase of the Indian Ocean Dipole. It tends to favor more rising motion here in phases four and five. And if the Indian Ocean Dipole does end up favoring an MJO that moves over the maritime continent area, this has an effect in the central part of the United States at limiting, uh, limiting moisture return mid to late summer and building bigger ridges to the east. Now, I'm already concerned about that given the cold water here and what seems to be the development of the negative, excuse me, excuse me, the positive phase of the Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation. <laughs> now, I know we're at the end of a video and I'm tossing out a lot of terms here, but what I wanna stress is, I think we need to watch the Indian Ocean much more carefully in conjunction with, with what I've been telling you about the cooler water off the west coast and the reason for that is if the MJO favors phase four and five for July and August, this is what it tends to do here. Let's go back to that time period. Here it is. This is July, August, September. The upper levels of the atmosphere tend to favor bigger ridges parked in this area should it stay over in phase four or phase five. And that's going to be something where we have to start being concerned about maybe just regional drought developing in the U.S. at that time scale. We're talking about midsummer though here, just giving you some longer term perspective. Okay, I've carried on enough. I'm going to wrap it up there. I'll talk to you again on Monday. Thanks.